Good afternoon and welcome to the third event hosted by the Language Collaboratory, a partnership for the advancement of intercollegiate dialogue and the teaching of languages and cultures driven by language centers and institutes at the University of Iowa, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, Michigan State University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our aim is to provide collaborative professional development opportunities for educators of language, culture, and literature at all five institutions. Our series this fall addresses perennial issues of accessibility, inclusivity, and learner autonomy and agency through the lens of our current shared circumstances and approaches these issues from a variety of perspectives, building on the expertise of individuals on our own campuses. We aim to share insights and to encourage interinstitutional dialogue, bridging the institutional distance and fostering a collaborative interchange of ideas. You are invited to contribute to what we hope will be a lively discussion. There you go, thanks. The sessions will be recorded and made available through each institution's uh, website. Uh, we ask that you mute your microphone at the outset, that you use the tools in Zoom to contribute questions and comments in the chat, and during the open discussion period to raise your hand virtually prior to activating your microphone. Closed captioning is available through the live transcript option in the Zoom menu bar. Um, Adolfo, I think we need to set, put that, um, to set that setting. Thank you. Uh, before we start today's discussion, next slide. Uh, just a reminder that the next event will be held one week from today at this time, hosted by the University of Iowa on teaching strategies for signed languages. Today we're hosting the event at the University of Minnesota. My name is Dan Sonneson. I'm the director of the Language Center in the College of Liberal Arts. And today I'll be speaking with Dr. Mandy Menke, who is the associate, I mean, who is the language program director for the Department of Spanish and Portuguese here in Minnesota. Here she directs a Spanish language program with upwards of 2,000 students per semester, managing courses with 20 plus sections per semester level, which, which provides her with a rather unique perspective on our accessibility topic. Mandy, I'll let you take, uh, take this on and we'll carry on a conversation as, as we go. Sounds great, thanks Dan. Um, so as Dan said, I oversee our language program. So what that means is I do, I get unique access to seeing what some of the, the challenges and the barriers that students face to accessing foreign language instruction are. And I also get to problem solve and innovate with our instructors around how we can best help them learn the language. But what that means is I am not a specialist in learning disabilities. I am not a, a consultant that works with our, our Disability Resource Center. So what I've set up today is just I was going to share kind of a little bit of information around what we're seeing, um, maybe offer some considerations and questions that we've been asking, and then really hoping for that dialogue, that conversation, so that we can really bring our collective expertise to this topic. So um, to start with, I really like this quote, and it may be one that you've um, seen before from Albert Einstein, where he says that everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And I start with this because sometimes with our instructors, we have to take a step back and really revisit what an accommodation is and that we're not changing expectations, but we're rather allowing students to fully we're making modifications so that students can fully access the curriculum. So we are not, as I said, we're not changing expectations. We're not changing the level of the course in any way, but what we are doing is providing equal access to learning and equal opportunity for students to demonstrate what it is that they have learned. So that's what I like to, to just wanted to frame this with. Um, and I often, like I said, I have to remind our instructors of this because sometimes this can be a challenge getting our head around this. So we at the University of Minnesota work with our, what we call the Disability Resource Center. And they send us our letters at the beginning of every semester around what accommodations specific students will need. And in a typical semester, um, when we're face-to-face, -face, the three most common 
requests um, for accommodations that we receive are flexibility with attendance and due dates, additional time for exams, and having a note taker in class. One of the things that we've found this semester is that by being online and having more asynchronous components, some of these accommodations are already being accommodated. So to a certain extent, students can complete work on their own time. So if they need an extra day, that's not a big deal. Or if they, you know, have um, anxiety and they can't get it done, we can accommodate that easily in the, with the asynchronous um, components of the course. We can also set those individual time limits. One of the challenges that we were starting to face is that our, our Disability Resource Center was no longer, didn't have enough physical space and enough people to administer all of the exams on site. Um, and so we were having to start to figure out how we could administer exams. And you can imagine with, as Dan said, over 2,000 students in a semester, that was a large number of students that we were trying to figure out how we could potentially do it, um, exams in-house with each of their um, distinct accommodation accommodations. And then finally, the note taker, by having recordings of presentations, students could go back and listen multiple times and take their own notes. So um, they could make them meaningful and a note taker isn't always needed. So that's kind of what the some of the affordances that we were seeing of the online environment and how those were uh, addressing some of the typical requests. That said, there are these additional affordances that the online environment gives us. It gives us increased time and increased interactions with the content. So for students, this means that they have opportunities to listen to things or read things multiple times. They have opportunities to reflect before they're asked to produce or to respond. And we have actually seen for some of our quieter students that they're participating more than they might in a face-to-face -face class. So this is an affordance. And then we've also, just as we today have the captioning on, we know that that's a support that can be there for students, that they can read what's being said to help support their listening. Additionally, that we can record sessions. And we indeed, at the beginning of the semester, we saw a number of accommodation letters come with those last two items identified as required accommodations. Um, and these were new for us and they raised a lot of questions for us um, because with the captioning, for example, we want students to develop listening skills. And so if they're reading captions rather than listening, what does that mean for the development of their listening skills and how do we assess that? It also, the recordings raised a lot of concerns for our instructors who a, all of a sudden they felt like their anxiety was going up because they didn't want to be recorded or they were concerned about other students in the class who wouldn't want to be recorded. So what I'm gonna share right now are some of the questions and considerations that we asked as non-experts um, working with, um, so with students with disabilities, some of the questions that we asked to help us make decisions and have those conversations both with students and um, our Disability Resource Center. So what the first question that we asked, and we had to remember that every individual student is unique and what he or she needs is different. And so that's where we often started was what does the student need? So in the case of the recordings, we might ask how, might you use these recordings? Do you need the whole class recorded? Is it only part of the class? Um, because we aren't lecturing like some of the other courses might be. And so there's not a lot to take notes on per se. So what do you, what do you need? The big question that we kept coming back to is what are our learning goals? And how does changing one piece impact the student's ability to meet those goals? Because remember, when I said at the outset, the accommodations are not meant to change expectations at all, but to give greater access to, to learning opportunities. And so that was a big question. Um, one of the questions that we also found helping helpful was asking, would the student need this accommodation in their first language? So for example, if we have a student who is hard of hearing and could not um, listen 
and hear all of the different sounds in a, a recording in some sort of audio, then, and they would need captioning in their first language, maybe it makes sense that they have the captioning then in the second language. So we asked that question. We also started asking how will accommodations impact other students and the instructor? And then one of the big questions that we were asking and Dan um, referenced this at the beginning is the size of our program. So how do we ensure consistency and sustainability across sections in a large program such as ours? So how do we make sure that every student's getting what they're needing, but that it's sustainable and that we're being consistent? So that's kind of the, the setup that I had wanted to give to our conversation. And what I think Dan and I had talked about maybe doing is asking what other considerations you might add to this list or what other considerations you are taking into control or into consider, what other things you're taking into consideration in your context right now. Yeah, and please uh, feel free to speak. Raise your hand, we'll call on you. I mean, oh, go ahead, Kate. I'll kick things off. I'm not a language program director anymore, but I was for a long time. And the question that I, I'm thinking about, Mandy, as you were talking was, you started off by talking about treating all students equally and giving them equal access. But I wonder how you are dealing with that in relation to the question of consistency because um, as a language program director, you're sort of looking at things from the big picture view and you're thinking about the administration of the program as opposed to the specifics on the ground in the classroom that the teachers are thinking about more. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that sort of push-pull that you have as wanting to give equal access but also needing to maintain certain standards in the program. So I think we outlined some standards with each of our instructors like kind of from the get-go and then one of the things that our instructors tend to do is check in with whether it be me or with their specific course supervisor around how that looks because then we can ensure that students with similar letters right that we're treating those accommodations in the same way um, this semester i would actually say is the most hands-on i've been in dealing with these because we were seeing new requests, right? There were new accommodations that were coming up that we haven't seen previously. And so um, it was actually good for me to be hands on because then I could see across sections across courses what the requests were and we could treat them. We could maintain that consistency then. Does that answer kind of what you were asking? Okay. One of, one of the issues, as you as you as you point out, is that you know we have we have the ability to do closed captioning, and that's just great uh, if your class is being conducted in English. Um, the the accommodation here, if conducting a course in Spanish or any other language, it's not quite as as nice as um, um, as it is in English. Are are you or are others encountering this this same issue? Uh, milagros. milagros. Yes, I, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I try to do the closed captioning and they're horrible in Zoom. I tried actually to put it in, you know, my whole program into Spanish and you now they're horrible. I did find a way to put uh, the uh, closed captioning in the Cultura. But for example, when I try to use the Flipgrid or the Boistred, Again, it, it was a horrible, the, the closed captioning. So, I mean, that's part of, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to use them better. So Kaltura has an, has an option of doing um, uh, closed captioning, which is pr probably a little bit more um, useful than the Zoom, uh, but it still needs quite a bit of control, right? Yes, and, and what I actually started doing with the first videos, I actually started going through the transcript and actually manually change them myself but it was taking forever to do that for every single video so <laughs> i just told my students if you do need the transcript uh, and you're having issues just let's get together and we'll work together with that but trying to do every single um video making sure it was accurate this is for a beginning spanish 
So it, it's even worse. <laughs> so yeah. Milagros, I'm curious. Did you? How do I want to ask this? Did you wonder at all if by including the captioning that students were going to rely on that more than, and so develop their listening in essence rather than relying on their li listening? or develop their reading instead of their listening because they'd be reading the captions? Because that's something that we kind of went through as well as we thought about those requests. Well, I, I gave them the option of having that because, I mean, for the beginning, they were very anxious, especially mm. because they seen each other frequently. So I, I told them they had, I, I will, my recommendation was to first watch the videos without the closed captioning and then watch it with the closed captioning so you can actually pick whether you want them or not. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, Yes and no. I mean, at this point, it was just making students comfortable with with the, <laughs> you know, with the with the material than anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things that our Disabilities Resource Center provides is um, is a simultaneous transcriber. Mm -hmm. um, so they they offer this on their website. And um, has anybody had success with that? With having someone. Uh, personally transcribe simultaneously what's going on in their class in a language other than English? Well, I don't have a comment on an accommodation letter per se that someone is requesting or officially requesting the accommodation. It's just that a, a couple of my students asked me like unofficially to, you know, that accommodation. So that's why, you know, it's not something that we're going to the Disability Center. I know we have actually, we have, and I think we just have one student that has that happening. Um, and I think it's at, in our composition conversation course. Um, I have not followed up to see how it's going though, but I do know that we have that and that they did provide that for one student because the closed captioning in Zoom was not of high enough quality as Milagros was saying. And we did work with them. I mean, they were also providing captioning in both Portuguese and Spanish for video content as well. Um, for like video, YouTube videos or other videos that we might be bringing in. Most of our publisher produced content had had the captioning already available, but anything that in, individual instructors found, if they didn't have captioning, they had, were able to outsource that and have somebody do it in whichever language. I'm, I'm also interested in sort of following up on the, um, <clears throat> the, this, your fourth um, issue here, how will accommodations impact other students and the instructor? Um, what, what sort of, do you have, might you have a kind of an example that you might um, um, point to or do you, uh, or do others? I think for me, time consuming, <laughs> you know, trying to like manually change the transcripts to make sure that they were correct. Uh, just one video that is like seven, 10 minute video took me an hour. Oh yeah, I mean, the, boy, the, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm thinking, for example, um, you know, Mandy, you mentioned um, that, uh, that doing transcripts or, or making accommodations such as transcripts when you're really trying to focus on listening comprehension um, for, you know, we, we talked about universal design a couple of weeks ago. And for that, it's kind of making, making, um, providing opportunities that everyone has access to. But in providing opportunities that everyone has access to, are you undercutting your own program goals? Well, that's the question. <laughs> what, do, what, what do others think about this? I think in this situation, we just have to be flexible because I mean, the, everything is so much changing in the online environment that I think even though I don't want to change the standards of the class, I also have to see that some students do not learn well online. So it's a completely different environment than being in person. So I, in, in that sense, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more accommodating and yes, you know, probably not the best thing to for you know the listening comprehension, the, the acquisition, but at the same time, I want students to be comfortable with the material. So it's like, 
Ja. Mandy, you have a couple of cases we've talked about as we were talking about this project. Do you do you want to um, share one uh, with us? Uh, sure. Um, well, like this one actually might be fun. So we have um, in one of our courses, we have a blind student or significant with significant vision impairment. Um, and so the original right in a traditional classroom environment, this student has a, um, I forget what they're called, not an advocate, but they have an assistant, I think is the word they use, that sits next to them. And anytime there's an image on the screen, kind of whispers in their ear, gives them a visual description or a, a linguistic description of what's on the screen. Um, but in Zoom, you can imagine how difficult that might be to have, you know, the main audio stream and then all of a sudden have some other channel going on just for this student. Um, and so we really had to talk through a number of different possibilities of how we might be able to accommodate this student. And, and one of the, the challenges was at times those images are purely decorative, but other times those images are essential for instruction in this sense of um, maybe that's the image that the students have to produce language to describe, right? So it's not even us that can do the, the, the description. We want the students to provide their dis the description in order to develop their language skills. So that was one of the considerations we had to talk through with, with our Disability Resource Center. Um, also, right, you can, we all know it's a little clunky managing multiple um, apps, multiple applications at the same time, right? Having Zoom open, plus maybe having a Google Doc open, plus having, you know, we use Canvas, you know, like having different things open how does that impact so if we do include like alt text descriptions with images and share a file with the student they now have to have both zoom open and this other thing that they're trying to use a screen reader on at the same time so this was one of our situations this semester that um, are scenarios that we were facing so i'm curious to hear from others like what thoughts you might have about that what um accommodations you might think of, what questions that raises for you. Um, I think if there's a there's a comment, Kelsey has a has a comment, uh, another case that's that's somewhat similar with a student with uh, dyslexia um, mm. and dysgraphia. Um, what I mean, it, it, it seems a very similar sort of a situation. Um, and she's also asking for uh, suggestions on how to deal with something like this, particularly when so much of what you're doing is visual. It is interesting to me, um, Kelsey, you point out there that where more work is done, well, both on the computer screen, but also in chat, right? It's it even today, right? I think we're all sometimes more comfortable putting our things in chat because managing the, the dynamics of conversation in Zoom can be awkward. And so it's interesting to think about that and how that impacts a student with this particular challenge. Uh, Does anybody have any thoughts on how we could think about that in the online environment and how to support this learner with what's basically happening in chat and all the all the all the screen time that he or she is facing and reading? Jean, you've responded uh, in the chat. Do you want to? Can you elaborate on on your response at all? Not really, because I haven't paid too close attention to the the posts that the, as they've been coming in. I think it might have been on the social justice SIG, but I'm looking for it right now because I have access to it. But I think that the link might not be accessible to everyone or that you have to log in. But there was a post um, nine days ago by a world language coordinator in Kansas who was asking for help supporting learners with dyslexia. And then there were some uh, responses that came in including um, some literature published by Actful on um, 
making the language classroom more accessible to students with disabilities. Um, and apparently there are also some, I mean, there's a lot of literature on dyslexia apparently and foreign language learning. Yeah, this one is called Foreign Languages for Everyone. Um, it's one of the titles that's mentioned. I'll just post that. But there weren't a lot of solutions in the in the chat. And, the, and these actually are not specific for online learning, I don't think. Yeah, so somebody had asked about resources like in advance when they submitted the registration and I tried to do some searches for what was out there and I'm not a member of the social justice sake so the the conversation that was happening in actful did not come across um, across my inbox at this point um, but yeah that foreign languages for everyone is um, a book that I actually did come across and I and I know Irene she is retired from oh, oh I forget the name of the college Calvin in college I think or corners I can't remember one of the colleges is in West Michigan which is where I, I met her um, and she's done some work and one of the things but yeah and I included two other links there as well but one of the things that I found is I think Jean was is just saying this that these are all kind of in the face-to-face -face classroom as I tried to look for online specific resources um, I didn't find a whole lot first of all but then secondly most of what I found was really geared towards younger learners um, not university students so I think any resources we can find yeah would be great to to share as we find them we can we can be putting them onto our various websites as well um, um, to um, for you to follow up on if you'd like. Um, our time is, is coming to a close. Uh, 30 minutes goes by very quickly. And uh, I want to extend special thanks to Mandy Menke to, uh, for being here with us today and for sharing some of her experiences with us. And I want to thank you all for attending. Um, this is, as I say, um, our attempt to um, bring us closer together and to uh, give us an opportunity to um, share our experiences and our concerns, um, particularly among these very, very current topics of accessibility, inclusivity, and, um, and student autonomy. Um, thanks so much, uh, Mandy, and thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you again next week.